Well, it's August 18th, it's Thursday morning. Good morning, I'm Andy Johnson. Welcome to it. This is AM Prime here at WESN. Thanks for being with us as usual. Let's tell you what's happening this morning. We're starting our discussion with Ms. Leticia Cox. She's the second vice president of the Registered Nurses Association. We're talking about their protest uh, in Port Spain. Uh, we know what they're talking about. We'll get to that in a moment. Karen Bascom, he's an agricultural journalist. We're talking with him also about uh, subcola Act, Act Tech for Agri. What is it? And why are we talking about that? We're also talking with Mr. Ravi Shankar. He's a marketing manager of the American University of Barbados. And then in the second hour, Janice Scott. She's a counselor for Calvary. And Lynette Ramcharan, counselor for Malabar North. They're talking about Parang in Arima, the 134th anniversary of Arima as a borough. And you know, they like to, to, to make the fact that they are the only royal chartered borough anywhere within sight. Those things and more on the program this morning. We share with you the Newsday poll, the question and responses, among other things. So stay with us. We're coming back in a moment. Welcome to the American University of Barbados School of Medicine. We offer two comprehensive MD programs five-and-a-half-year program for high school finishers, and four-year program for college graduates. The American University of Barbados has been accredited with the Barbados Accreditation Council, BAC, and has been accredited by CAMHP. As the medical school has affiliate hospitals at Baltimore and Chicago in the USA and the Caribbean islands. Fan Zone, your reliable, authentic supplier has just gotten better. You can now visit our website www.fanzonett.com for your authentic wear and collectibles. The only place where you can use both your Visa debit and credit cards. Visit our website fanzonett.com to make your purchase today. Every word, every line. Every paragraph depicts a real moment in someone's life. A father, a sister, a mother, a brother. We at Newsday are dedicated to you, the people, and through independent, unwavering journalism, strive to always bring your stories to life. Because your stories are more than just words. Newsday, independent and credible. This is protesting outside the Ministry of Education yesterday, and you heard the cry. We're talking about that now with Ms. Leticia Cox. She's the second vice president of the Registered Nurses Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Ms. Cox, good morning. Hi, good morning, and how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm great, but um, in health, good health, but I'm a bit disheartened by um, what's going on. And that um, footage that you saw there, those are our nursing students. And this is the first entry before you become a nurse, a registered nurse, a registered mental nurse. And um, it's very sad because it shows the disrespect and the maltreatment of the government towards nursing and midwifery. And it starts from the level of studentship. And I want to say that I am proud of the nursing students for standing up. I know they are tuned in right now and they are eager for someone to hear, um, some stakeholder to hear, to really listen and really address their needs today. So that's why they were protesting outside the, the Ministry of Education, because they are, they are yes. nursing students. Mm -hmm. They are nursing students. And what would have happened to the nursing students is that during the pandemic, and this is Costat um, nursing students specifically, what would have happened during the pandemic, those two years, they were prevented from doing their clinical practice. You see, in nursing, we have clinical and we have theory. 
And because they were prevented from doing their clinical practice, which has had no fault of theirs, they were denied their stipend. And when I say stipend, I mean this is just $1,000 or so they have been denied. And this is the funds that they would use for books to assist with paying school fees and just, just this is just nominal. And even to help with any little expenses at home because for quite a few they would have dedicated and and forsaken other job opportunities to study nursing so it was really a financial hardship and challenge for these nursing students to be denied at no fault of theirs from being um, a part of the clinical um, practice within the wards what is the relationship between the, the nursing students and the the association well, the relationship is this. They are very critical because this is the future workforce. This is where we would get our membership. Because when they graduate and they become fully registered nurses, they are a part of our membership. So it is very important and a very vital part of the association. And we are saying it was unreasonable to deny these students this stipend during this period because most persons were vulnerable, and this is your critical human resource. Students are very important. They are actually utilized by the nursing staff to really um, you know, curtail the short staffing on the wards. And they feel used, they feel abused, and they feel neglected. And the whole issue of stipend is not the only issue that they are going through right now. But before I move from the stipend, I would want to highlight that there was some confusion as to who was responsible for paying this stipend to them. Is it COSTAT? Is it the Ministry of Education? And they were using this confusion to delay payment of stipend outside us as well of the pandemic. And word coming to the association is that when the ministry would have heard that they had this planned process, protest yesterday, they would have paid some of the students an arrears in um stipend so you say that they, they that's the ministry of education ministry of finance would have released the funds and somehow one of the organizations they still have not owned up to say who is responsible for organizing and ensuring that the students are paid so the students are still waiting for one of them either costat or ministry of education to state who is responsible for gathering the information and sending the um subvention to the, the, the directive to the Ministry of Finance as to the payment of the stipend. Where is the, the, ministry, where is the Ministry of Health in this? Any, anywhere? The Ministry of Health was actually in charge of nursing students at one point. I, I, I think it was under my, when I graduated in 2010, before then, Ministry of Health, we fell under Ministry of Health. However, Ministry of Health had then given over that responsibility to the Ministry of Education. But for the most part, COSTAC used to be in charge of the nursing students and would have taken charge of those things in terms of payments. However, there, because of that transfer to the Ministry of Education, there became this dilemma as who is responsible to ensure that nursing students be paid. Now, what we have realized as an association that students within COSTAC, within the University of the Southern Caribbean, and within the U UE School of Nursing, they do not receive stipend for some reason. There's always an issue with giving that little subvention to help the nursing students during their period of study. And I would like to highlight nursing and midwifery is an essential service industry. And the other essential services such as prisons, maybe um, um, police and so on, they are paid while they train. But for some reason, nursing and midwifery are maltreated from studentship up. We see it right now as we graduated where when these nursing students go through all these trials, when they graduate, they don't have job security because right now in the system, they are getting temporary employment. They are not being granted permanent employment. So we have these issues to treat with. One other thing I would also like to mention, the students saying that not only are they being deprived of money, financial remuneration to be able to help them during their program. The campuses are now closed at Sandy Grandi and El Dorado. 
forcing students from the north and from Sandy Grand East to now go to Shabonas and South campuses. They are saying that the Shabonas campus is quite unsafe in that area where they are there. I think they would have to tell me exactly where the name of the street. I'm in communication with them, but they're saying that Shabonas campus is not safe. They're saying that the distance and access to that route, it costing them in that area, in the, the north area and so on, a lot of money to get there. So it's causing even more hardship. So it favors more those persons who would live in the Shabonas and San Fernando and the south area. So they are having that issue as well. Yeah, and, and w w Among these, these three locations, which agency, which one of these agencies they fall under? It's Costat. Costat is actually running the institutions, but nursing education falls under the Ministry of Education. So the Ministry of Education is tasked overall with nursing and, and midwifery education. However, the, there are different schools that run or manage these programs. And the government subvention sub in terms of stipend, it is something that is granted by the government, not the school, right? So, you know, it, it becomes very difficult now when the students in that dilemma, when Costat is telling them that, well, they are not really responsible to pay the stipend, it's really the Ministry of Education. And the Ministry of Education is telling them something else, it's Costat. So everybody is trying to pass the buck. Now, one of the other issues the students are saying that is causing financial hardship for them as well, inclusive of the um, the stipend, is the fact that they are be their, their program is being prolonged for more than their stipulated three or four years. Some are saying that they're staying for almost seven years in a program because they cannot get to register for certain courses, and that in itself caused them to be denied gate. Because if they go beyond their three years, Gates is telling them that they are no longer paying them. If they go beyond their three years, there's a policy now that states that you will not be eligible for your stipend. And this is of no fault of theirs. And they want the stakeholders to hear their cry, that they are suffering, that they are the future health workforce of Trinidad and Tobago. And there must be some sort of incentive and some sort of concession for them so that they can operate, that so that they can learn, that they, they can finish their training within their stipulated time. Um, so there are so many things that the um, nursing students would have raised with me, and so much that I wouldn't be able to cover here. But they are hoping that there's someone, somebody within the Ministry of Education, somebody within the government listening right now, and understand that there needs to be urgent intervention at that school. Well, you, you have some time to, to go into some of them, if you, if you like, mm -hmm. one or two of them. Yes, right. So I would like just to talk about All right, let's see what happens there, the... Um, the, the, the extreme backs on what I just stated there. I, I think we, we, missed, we missed it because um, you, you froze up, your, your, the transmission froze up a little bit. So if you want to go back to it, if you... Um, you hear me? Uh, I'm Sorry. saying that we, we missed you there a little bit, so... Yes. Yes, you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. So, Costat, in the past, the nursing department was had their own department head and it was managed very effectively by a nursing head now it's it's something different and we used to have what we would call cohorts where the nursing students would have been trained in groups and it was more organized where there was stipulated times when you finish your theory and then when you do your clinical practice now it's a bit um chaotic when students are doing courses and te theory and clinical on their own, they don't have the support. They are saying that they don't have supervision on the wards. There are no clinical instructors to guide them. So they are lost and it's affecting them um, in terms of their grades and completing the program. And, and mind you, these things, people may look at it slight and say, oh, watch these nursing students. And this is your future health workforce. If they are delayed in graduating, if they are not passing their exams, it means that you will be short in getting the health workforce that you need within the hospitals. So we are saying that 
COSTAT, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health, the government, they need to wake up and intervene in this situation. Thousands of nurses are trained by, the, by COSTAT, and this needs to be looked into. I would also like to raise that it is unreasonable to think that you can pay a $1,000 stipend only when the student reaches in the clinical setting, meaning doing practice on the ward. When you sign up for nursing, you should be given that opportunity to focus completely on, on, on your program. Therefore, your needs, which would cover your expenses, your groceries, your books, it should be taken care of by the government because when you graduate, you are given year old man service to the country of Trinidad and Tobago. And this does not bode well in terms of the treatment from our nursing students straight up to the nurses on the ward. We are maltreated. Yeah. So, I, yes. just, I just have a curiosity. The school in Takari, where that used to be headed by Dr. Ocho, that comes under, that falls under which agency? That's UE. That's the, the, the University of um, School of Nursing, UE. Yeah, that's, that's UE, School of Nursing. That falls under Dr. Ocho, but Costa is um, separate. That's a different organization. Yeah. And, and among the three places but, of... Um, Dr. Ocho, the UE School of Nursing, they yeah. share that compound in El Dorado with Costa at one point. But, for, but the information that I'm getting is that that campus, Costa, is being closed and they are now going to focus their training in Shogunas and South only, which places the um, population who wants to become nurses or who are currently nursing students at a disadvantage because they now have to pay more to reach the Shogunas and South campus. So there seems to be a lot of flux in, in, in this program of education for nurses in the country and for nursing in the country, wouldn't you say? Yes. What what is happening? I there's a starvation of funding to healthcare for some reason. I don't know if somebody thinks healthcare is not important because this means that is the healthcare of the healthcare of your of your population is your wealth. If your 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 people is are sick, if they are not being taken care of, if there is not there is insufficient people to care for those who are sick, what does that say for your population? The Costat um, Costat administration would have sent out an email to the students highlighting that. They, um, because of the, the, the funding, lack of funding, that's why they have been encountering the problems and why they would not have, the, the, there's this um, significant delay in the payment of their, their stipends and, and those kinds of things. And, and we want to believe that, yes, they may be going through some funding issues. And we would want to know what's happening at the Ministry of Finance. Why, uh, um, why is Costa being starved of funding? Um, the clinical instructors would have also reached out to me and said that they have their old gratuity, some two years, some three years. So there, there's maltreatment of the nursing students. There's maltreatment of the clinical instructors who are in charge of teaching the students. And there's maltreatment of the nurses. So when you do graduate, if you take seven years or eight years to finish the program and you come into one of the RHAs, you are now told that you can only get one month, three months, six months, one year temporary employment. How does that look for the health workforce? So that's an issue that um, is somewhere near the top of the agenda for the, for, the, for the union, you would say, even if, you know, it's strictly speaking, the union is not um, recognized to represent student nurses. And my, my other question is, among the three learning institutions, is there any substantive difference in, in, in the program, in, 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 let's say, in, in, in the, um, the curriculum? Well, with regards to the curriculum, what I am hearing from the students at Costa is that they are inundated with a number of courses that are not necessary in their estimation. It's not, uh, it's not necessary and it's prolonging the completion of their program. And I think that um, that is a reflection of the fact that someone um, who is alt who is who's a nurse educator is not ultimately in charge of setting the curriculum at Costat. Now, the University of the Southern Caribbean and the University of um, the U the, the, Southern Caribbean. the um, UE Nursing, UE School of Nursing, yes. they are more organized and their curriculum is more structured. So it centers around 
nursing and health issues and well of course it will have other subjects that is very pertinent and relates to nursing but it's more organized we also have um a program that the um, association is asking the government to actually discontinue because it's the apprenticeship program which is something that um that was you know it was relevant years ago but now nursing is being trained at a degree level so there's actually four nursing schools operating but okay. we would like the ministry apprenticeship program to come to an end and the degree programs to continue because that's what the standard internationally for nursing and midwifery at this time yeah so what you're saying there there's a, there's a lot to be treated with in this matter uh, in, mm -hmm. one, in one way or the other, but I, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there, Ms. Cox. Thank you very much. We'll try yes. and follow it up uh, as we go along. Thank you very much, Leticia Cox, Second Vice President of the Registered Nurses Association in Trinidad and Tobago. Let's see what comes of, of, of this raising, this consciousness raising on it. We can always get back to you at, at some appropriate time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. We're going to take a break. When we come back with, with you, we share the Newsday poll, the question and the responses. We could tell you the question before we go to the break. Do you believe that the police commissioner's latest organizational initiatives in the fight against crime will be effective? If so, why? If not, why not? Stay with us. Get ready for an explosion of music, an August evening at La Jolla Auditorium, featuring Leandra, Trikanal, David Baru and Marva, Nathaniel and from Tobago, John Arnold and Lynette Lewis. August 20th, $250, La Jolla Auditorium from 6 p.m. For more info, call 747-4289 or 262-2584. authentic supplier has just gotten better. You can now visit our website www.fanzonett.com for your authentic wear and collectibles. The only place where you can use both your Visa debit and credit cards. Visit our website fanzonett.com to make your purchase today. The best way to get are at thebesttoys.com. Shop for the best brands you love at the best prices. Like VTech, LeapFrog, Fisher Price, Play Doh, Hot Wheels, Bobby, Coco Melon, LOL, Baby Alive, Crayola. Visit us in store at Forces Flagship Mac Bean. Shop online now at dbesttoys.com. Order via call or WhatsApp at 32 DBest to order. And remember, we have the best toys at the best prices. There's a taste in the air everywhere. Feel the vibe cause it's something to share. And creamy, you find it right here. Makes you smile, relax a while. It's fun and good chair. Ooh, enjoy every scoop. Ooh, every taste will get you. We have flavors that you love, a combination special. Come along, enjoy our treats. This is Uncle Pete's. What's the best way to grab the attention of viewers? Please exercise more patience. You have to be kidding me. Doing what we do best. I'll say at the very least it's a conspiracy of laziness against the people. Join me, Keaton Shaw. And me, Sean Michael Small, for Talking Point. Weekdays from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. We go in-depth on the trending issues and engage the most controversial newsmakers as we get them to account to the people for their actions. You can't go to the government with nothing. You can't go to cabinet yeah. with an with a, with a empty hand, with a wish. I'm mm -hmm. glad that we're having this is a sober, mature discussion. In the present situation, 
I expect a continuation of the chaos. Join, Join us, us for, for the, the discussion, discussion, Mondays to Fridays, only on WESN, the content capital. People really want to know, what about me? Where do I fit? Yes. What is in the ride for me in terms of a better Trinidad and Tobago? And I'm pleased to shed some light on that. The purpose of bail is to ensure your attendance at court. That's it. It is not punitive. It is not rehabilitative. We the police officers, we are professional. And we are here for whenever the survivor is ready to come forward. We have the right to private and family life, the right to religious freedoms and beliefs and thoughts and expression. But these rights are not absolute. Certain rights can be limited. The law is to govern. The whole is for all of us in public. People get confused, they go into the grocery and they're like, you know what, I, I want to change my life. I want to eat better. As exciting as the front of a label looks, the back of the label is really where it's at. If something has less than 5% in that particular serving of that nutrient, then it's probably a low source. If it has 20 or more, then it's a high source. Smoothies are not really into that because the texture or I don't like what people put in there, but the good thing about a smoothie is that you can make it your own. You can literally put whatever you want. If you really like bananas, you can put bananas. If you really don't like bananas, don't put bananas. Like, it's really that simple. What's up, Doc? Tuesdays and Thursdays, here on WESN, Content Capital. Is it politics? What is it? Is it that nobody cares about sports? The kind of support that sport used to get in the past is, is no longer here. The thing is, taking a knee doesn't mean that that's the only thing you're doing around here. Right. Taking a knee along with other stuff. Samantha, what are you looking forward to when you return home to Trian Tobago after winning the title? Thank you very much for speaking it into existence. Is it no pressure on Nicholas Paul? It makes me more motivated to work hard and to go all day and rep the red, white and black. Why are we sending a team to the Winter Olympics? There are a number of Trinbegonians who are in the diaspora and have grown up in winter sport. It's an opportunity that the Trin and Tobago Olympic Committee will not close the door. I also believe in the players that we have. Once you can motivate the players, you can get the best out of them. Let your voice be heard. Call Madam Fix It on WESN, the only place that effectively helps you with your woes. Having problems getting onto government agencies, water woes, NIS and pension problems, potholes, and much, much more. Call me, Madam Fix It, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, right here on WESN. Let me fix it for you. Welcome back to the program with us now. Here are these guests, Mr. Karen Bascom, Mr. Destin Pope, and Mr. Neetram Ramnanan. Mr. Bascom is listed as an agricultural journalist. Mr. Pope as operations lead in something called Tech for Agri. And Mr. Ramnanan is a regional representative of the CABI. You can tell us what that is when we get to that. They're talking about Agro Investment Invested Forum Expo 2 Tech for Agri 360. Well, good morning to all of you. Good morning. Uh, let, let's start with you, Mr. Pope. So you are the operations lead on, on this thing called AgriTech 4. And the question is, what is that? What, what more can you tell us about that? So it's Tech 4 Agri. Yeah. Right? So Tech 4 Agri is a social enterprise that uses media. Yeah. Right. I'll get to that. It uses? Right. So we use uh, media journalism and communication to support stakeholders in the agricultural sector. Uh, we also use it to support agri-allied fields such as climate change, rural development. Um, we provide services such as um, facilitation services, facilitation services, training and development, journalism workshops. Um, we also do uh, media and video production. All right, uh, that's, that's, that's a bunch there. Mr. Mr. Bascom, Tech for Agri, Agricultural Journalists. Can you talk a little bit about that? Hi, morning. So, well, agricultural journalism is a, a bit self-explanatory. We are simply journalists that work in the agriculture sphere, but because of the nature of agriculture and its interconnectedness, we work in also in fields like climate change, the environment, rural development, and things like that. 
Tech for Agri was the first entity to start talking about technology and innovation in agriculture. And that was 11 years ago. So now we're fortunate to be here housed at CABI, where we continue our work with our main project, Tech for Agri 360. All right. Thank you very much. We'll come back to, to both of you. Let's bring Mr. Ram Nanan into the discussion. Regional representative for the CABI. And you, you told me what it is. You, uh, you, you can repeat it. What is CABI? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to Trinidad and Tobago. Um, CABI is Center for Agriculture Biosciences International. And where is and it we've, been, we've been present in Trinidad since 1946. Wow. Previously, we were known as... Um, the CAB International or um, CABI for short. Yes. He said it would be based in, in, in Trinidad. Yes, our offices are in St. Augustine and we've been, um, we are a member country organization. So Trinidad and Tobago has been a founding member of CABI. Um, CABI has been here since 1946. Um, sometime in the 70s, um, the International Center for Biological Control was headquartered here in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, all of these various biosciences institutes has now been amalgamated um, into CAB International, and we've been in existence for over 110 years. All right, um, since you, you have the floor, now let me just ask uh, to, to talk, tell us some more about this, this forum, the Expo 2 that we're talking about here, that, that is at the at the back of this discussion well expo okay. two i to be honest with you i'm a, i've been invited and i will be present um so i can't speak on behalf of the forum per se but what i can say is that forums such as these are needed to bring people together to make connections and to have the coordination that is necessary for investment to take place in the agriculture sector Part of the problem in um, food security is we do not have enough investment in the agriculture sector. So uh, um, Expo 2 or the Agri Forum is uh, such a needed um, forum. I can give you a quick experience. When I worked at NAMDEFCO in between 2004 and 2008, we had organized um, a food fair, a regional food fair. And we had, for example, a chef coming in from Antigua in one of the high-class hotels there looking for um, good quality locally sourced beef or from the region. He came to the fair and, and could not get it. So um, expositions like these, forums like these are needed to bring the stakeholders together um, to, to get business going. All right, so Mr. Mr. But it's not a beginning and it's not an end. It has to be part of a process. All right, good. Thank you very much, Mr. Bascom. You you were going to to say something. Oh well, I saw that um, you all put up the Tech for Agri 360 video in the background. What I will do is quickly explain it. Tech for Agri 360 is a knowledge tool that we have created that uses 360 degree video and our agri journalism skills to create this knowledge tool that assists in our education delivery. The purpose of it, as you can see there, 360 video allows you to see in all directions. This is what you would call a reframed or an edited 360 video. So it gives a whole lot more than dimensions. And then the other kind of 360 video is the raw kind, which utilizes a VR headset. Uh, Destin has a VR headset on him, so he can show you what it looks like and you utilize this by placing it to your face and you are immersed in a different environment. So many people would have seen Metaverse or Oculus or any of these other types of virtual reality. We are simply using reality. We are going out there into the field so that users, in particular children, can be outside, inside. All right, so Mr. Pope, can you take it up from there? He says um, you are disposed to talk a little more about it than, than, than he has? Oh, well, he kind of elaborated on most of it, but mm. the experience... Where, where is that we were looking at? The, 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 where, where, where is that happening? Um, where, where oh, Tech for Agri360 is happening 
it's an it's an online set digital agriculture project. Yeah, no, so, I mean the, the video with the with the animals oh, and the farm and so oh, oh. that would have been um, that is that um, that is at the farm of the Helping Children Grow Foundation. They are one of our main local partners. The Helping Children Grow Foundation is a preschool, a private preschool and primary school. Yes. And the school also has a farm. So where is so it? So that video is their farm, and we're doing a tour of their farm. And this was our market-ready sample that we'll be showing at the forum, plus content from our package, which we are rolling out. We are actually launching Tech for Agri 360 today, this morning, at the public affairs section of the U.S. Embassy in Port of Spain. Yeah. So straight after our launch, we will go. We will be at the forum. So we're inviting. From Trinidad and Tobago to come out and sample this new technology, sample this new um, immersive environment, and see what it is like and what it does and what we want to do and how we want to have it assist in stopping the education disruption that we are facing. All right, we uh, see the, the education solution. disruption, but uh, Mr. Wu, so where, where is the, the location that, that, that um, what we were seeing? Oh, there, this is. <laughs> Tech for Agri is located. No, no, no. He's asking. He's asking about the location of where it was filmed. Yeah. Where it was that, filmed. That, that, this is in Carson Field. Carson Field. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you were coming in. Yeah. So as um, Karen would have elaborated on, it provides uh, the use 360 video to provide you with an immersive experience. Now, um, people would have you already know about VR headsets, virtual reality, and stuff like yeah, that. A little but bit. I, I believe that using the, the content that we would have gone out there and collected in Trinidad and Tobago, as in real life, you get to go there and experience a place right in Trinidad that you would have never gone before. And you can use this within, within the education system to give children a little bit more stimulation, if you would. You know, some children are more prone to different types of learning. So this visual and in this interaction, you know, where they have on the headset and they can turn around and see different parts of the farm. I think that's one of the um, one of the best aspects of it, that they're in a different space and you're allowing them to kind of learn via being there, in a sense. Yeah. All right, Mr. Mr. Ramnanan, there's a question here. The Ministry of the Minister in the Ministry of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries, Avinash Singh, noted that it will take a regional effort and not just the effort of Guyana or Trinidad and Tobago for CARICOM to achieve full food security. Do you think this expo, this expo can help in achieving that objective? Yeah, yes, I think it will contribute it. And if I'm to say um, where I've seen successful agriculture, um, there are five factors that must be present for us to have um, successful agriculture. The firstly is generally the, a conducive environment. So for example, sugarcane was well adapted to our environment and we did produce sugarcane for a long time. Cocoa is another example that is well adapted to our environment. So that's the first thing. The second thing, we must have good genetic material um, that is highly producing highly and that sort of thing. You could have good genetic material and poor management and then don't get the full benefit of that genetic material. The thirdly is we must have ongoing research to anticipate problems, to solve pest problems, um, nutritional problems, etc., to ensure the proper livestock that is being produced is being produced at the maximum. Fourthly, the, the sector must be organized. So farmers, um, input suppliers, everybody must be organized. Usually they refer to this as a value chain. So we must have effective value chains in place. And then fifthly, we must have good marketing. When you look at some commodities, I've been at NAMDAFCO for four years, and when you analyze the local sector, for example, um, dashing bush or kalaloo bush, um, green watercress, those are some examples of a locally produced commodities that, that over 25, 30 years have only increased in price very um, slightly. And this is because some of these, the research and, and extension and so on may not be there, but the farmers are well, they understand the crop, they're in good environment, and they have this marketing linkage and everything else. And that is one of, when these factors come into play and are present, you have sustainable production uh, meeting the market requirements. Yeah. 
All right. So then. to the extent that right. the forum contributes to, to, to the marketing and the organization and so on, yes, it will, will contribute. All right. So, uh, Mr. Pope, do you think that this expo will help Trinidad and Tobago to purchase more local crops instead of purchasing stuff from outside, international crops? Um, certainly, I, um, I think the main purpose of an expo is to provide a platform for intellectual exchange, um, cultural exchange, and just um, provide a basis for information spread, right? Um, if this expo is marketed well and allows pulls in the public, I think they would understand um, the ideas that some of the organizations and other individuals that attend would be bringing forth. And I think, too, as well, the pandemic um, would have forced people to realize the importance of food security and purchasing local goods and even growing your own goods. So I think the expo um, would be a good thing for local, for Trinidad and Tobago as well. All right, so let's come back to you, Mr. Bascom. Uh, as COVID-19, as Mr. Pope uh, referred to a moment ago, as COVID-19 has had a big impact on the agriculture sector, do you think that with post-COVID, persons would push to purchase more locally, more locally instead of internationally? Not hearing you. Good, yes. Yes, I think, I guess I believe so, and that is possibly so, because the option to get our food from elsewhere is dwindling. And we, if we really sit and look, we will see that we will have more pandemics and more wars and more food crises and other global problems, climatic events, etc. So the aim should be to, as Mr. Bob mentioned, really work on the sector and solve the problems that it faces, very chronic structural, infrastructural issues that are still there in the sector. And COVID has kind of forced the digital transformation, but that is going to take some time. And in addition, it's an opportunity, the forum itself is an opportunity for small businesses and to expose themselves and for people to really start definitely focusing more on our local and what we can provide locally. However, it is also an investment forum. And this is where the government is saying we are open for business and we would like to do some type of national level investment project or what have you that contributes to our citizens. This is now the second forum because we had one in Guyana so i'm concerned how does the forum benefit stakeholders of the agriculture sector and at the ground level yeah i truly believe that the focus should be on small business and what we can contribute to our economy in terms of creating jobs in terms of creating options in terms of creating better service quality products I mean, there's so many, there's so much room for growth that would come from a different approach. All right, then, right now, we're still yeah. doing the traditional uh -huh. approach, which right, is how we're going to have to, we're gonna have to leave it there. So thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, just tell us where, <laughs> when, when is it? When is the, 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 the forum? Oh, well, the launch for Tech Fair will be today, yeah. and Tech Fair and the expo starts tomorrow. Tomorrow. So the yeah. launch should use a tech farm. Tech for Agri. Tech for Agri. Okay. Yeah. Right. Launch will be tech today. for Agri. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm looking at it. So, and, and the thing starts tomorrow. The, the, it, it takes place tomorrow. Yeah, um, Expo, that yeah. starts tomorrow. Uh, for how long? Um, that will run for three days, from Friday to Sunday. Okay, all right. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Bascom, Karen Bascom, Mr. Destin Poop, and Mr. Neetram Ramadan. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you very much. All right, all right so we're going to take a break, and when we come back, Mr. Ravi Shankar and Ms. Camille Jordan, the American University of Barbados. Stay with us.
The best for your baby is at thebesttoys.com. From the best strollers, car seats, baby carriers, high chairs, booster seats, rockers, jumpers and bouncers, walkers, baby blankets, feeding accessories, bathtubs, visit us in store at Horses Flagship Mackie. Shop online now at thebesttoys.com. Order via call or WhatsApp at 332 Baby. And remember, we have the best toys at the best prices. Welcome back to the program. We're talking now with Ms. Camille Jordan. She's the marketing manager for admissions at the American University of Barbados. And we're talking about the school intake at the University of Barbados, the American University of Barbados. Uh, Ms. Jordan, very good morning. Let me start by asking you to tell us uh, who the American University of Barbados School of Medicine is and how long have you been around? American, thank you for having me. Um, um, it's nice being in Trinidad and Tobago. American University of Barbados have been around uh, for about 12 years in Barbados and um, we are a school of medicine um, that's located in Barbados. We actually offer medicine for a five and a half year program uh, for high school finishers. Yes. Uh, and um, what are the courses offered and how are they benefiting the Caribbean people? Well, um, it's benefiting. The courses are offered are um, pre medical Well, we offer a pre-medical program as well as basic sciences. It's basically uh, medicine, like anatomy, uh, uh, calculus, uh, chemistry, physics, um, biochem, and all of those. And it's benefiting to the Caribbean because these Caribbean uh, students, high school finishers, they can start straight out of um, high school. So as soon as they finish CAPE, um, they can apply to the school. Once they have biology, chemistry, and physics, they can apply with those CAPE results, and um, we'll be able to um, enroll them into the school. So what, what accreditations do you have? Uh, right now, we have the Barbados accreditation. Um, we, you have to have that accreditation in order to operate in the country. We are also accredited by the CAMHP, Caribbean Accreditation. Yeah, and, and, and what is the AUB's advantage over other medical schools, you'd say? Well, uh, we are U.S., we follow the um, U.S. Uh, curriculum, and um, we have extensive U.S. Emily preparation throughout the program, which is the, um, the licensing uh, board exam that they will have to do. And uh, we also have our medical clinic, which is for the students who are uh, going through the school. We have a free clinic on campus. Um, it will give students early exposure, what they would expect in the medical field. We yeah. also have like research facilities available for all students as well. And they do um, as, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, do you offer scholarships and how, how are they um, accessed? Okay, well, the scholarship programs, we have uh, CARICOM grants, which we give to the CARICOM students, anybody in the Caribbean, including Trinidad. Um, we have automatic grants for them. There are also grants that we offer for merits. If we have good grades, good, um, you know, ones, twos, A's and B's, we give automatic scholarships for those. Yeah, accommodation, uh, is that offered on or off campus? It is, we have both on and off campus. We have accommodation on dorms right now. Um, on the campus itself. How, how rigid is, your, is the admission process? Uh, what qualification is needed for entry? Okay, those students who would apply after they have finished CAPE, um, you, they are uh, uh, eligible to apply as soon as they finish CAPE. You, if they apply today, they can get admission within a week or so. And, um, you know, we just send that, up. once they send in the application, we have different our representatives who will give them a call, go through the process, let them know how visas are done, etc. So, so visas are necessary, uh, and uh, student visa, right? And can mm -hmm. someone who is a student work part time? Well, um, if the program is nine to five, Monday to Friday, a student may not have that time to work. And also, if you're on a student visa, you may not be able to work and study at the same time. You cannot have two visas. You can only have a student visa. And if you're working in Barbados, you have to have that work permit. So you don't, you cannot have both of them. 
But because the program is so extensive, nine to five, Monday to Friday, a student may not be able to, um, you know, uh, work and study at the same time. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Camille Jordan, Marketing Manager for Admissions at the American University of Barbados. Thank you very much for talking with us. Thank you so much, and they can always reach us at 1-246-428-2000 and by email info at aubmed.org. All right, thank you very much. Thanks well, for having me. All right, that takes us to the top of the hour. We're going to take a break for news, and when we come back, we're talking with Ms. Janice Scott. She's a counselor in the District of Calvary. And Lynette Ramcharan, counselor in Malabar North. The topic Parang in Arima, celebrating 134, the 134th anniversary of Arima as a borough. Stay with us. This is AM Prime on a Thursday morning. your WESN News on the Hour. I am Mahi Sekas. Thanks for joining us. Here are the headlines. CMO warns that COVID cases increasing. Increase in rolling average and hospitalizations reported. Opposition MP condemns government ban on exportation of scrap metals. And internationally, China inducing rainfall to combat severe drought. Now for the details. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Roshan Parshram is warning that COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations are increasing. Speaking at Wednesday's virtual media conference on COVID-19, the CMO revealed that data collected from samples tested confirms that Omicron subvariant BA5 is a dominant strain within TNT, but those whom are becoming infected and critically ill are either unvaccinated or partially vaccinated. BA5 now remains of, which is a sublineage of Omicron, remains the predominant uh, variant worldwide and is increasing. And in Trinidad and Tobago, as my later slides will show, it is the dominant sublineage of Omicron as well. Local, in, local cases increasing and hospitalizations are increasing as well. In terms of our variants of concern, as of August 12, 2022, Omicron continues to be the dominant variant in Trinidad and Tobago, detected in 103 out of the 108 samples. BA5 subvariant were the dominant of Omicron sublineages detected in the recent samples, accounting for 78%. Over the last five weeks, there has been an increase in the rolling average of COVID-19 cases. As a result, the number of seriously ill patients infected with the virus has increased creating a greater number of hospitalizations, ambulance usage, and accident and emergency calls. Up until the 17th of July or so, we would have been noticing a rolling average that was more or less stable. And over the past five weeks, we have noticed upward trends in the following areas. An increase in the confirmed number of COVID-19 cases. Today, we stand at a rolling average of 280. An increase in the hospitalization numbers today we are 227 we peaked at 228 yesterday which is one of the highest numbers that we have seen since the general decline in may we have also seen an increase in the accidents and emergency departments and an increase in the usage of the ambulance system for COVID-19. In other news, opposition MP Rudra Ranath Indasing is condemning the decision of Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley, Minister of National Security Fitzgerald Hines, and the PNM government's decision to impose a ban on exports from the scrap metal industry. In a statement, he said that this government continues to kill jobs, kill industries, kill sectors and take away the bread and butter of people in this country. Placing a ban on exports will compromise the well-being of the industry, which provides an income in these hard economic times for families trying to get by. 
He added that the issue isn't the scrap iron industry. The issue is a criminal element within the industry. In international news, Chinese authorities are attempting to induce rainfall in parts of central and southwest China amid a severe drought and record-breaking heatwave. The Yangtze River, Asia's longest waterway, is now at record low levels. In some stretches, there has been less than half of the usual rainfall. Hydropower reservoirs are currently down by as much as half, officials say. At the time, a surge in demand for air conditioning has put power companies under extreme pressure. Well, that's news to the hour and WESN. I am Marky Sekas. Thanks for watching. Welcome to the American University of Barbados School of Medicine. We offer two comprehensive MD programs, five and a half year program for high school finishers and four year program for college graduates. The American University of Barbados has been accredited with the Barbados Accreditation Council, BAC, and has been accredited by CAMHP. As the medical school has affiliate hospitals at Baltimore and Chicago in the USA and the Caribbean islands. All right, welcome back to the program. We're talking now with Ms. Lynette Ramcharan. She's a counselor for Malabar North, and Ms. Jeanette, Ms. Janice Scott. Uh, she's a counselor for Calvary, and they're talking about the 134th anniversary of Arima as a borough, and they like to put in the fact that it's the only royal chartered borough probably in the world. Uh, we're talking about Christmas 2022. Take it from there. Ms. Scott, let's start with you. Yes. So this year, Arima is celebrating the... 134th year as a royal chartered borough yes. and in order to do that we found you know seeing that in particular we would not have had any festivities for the past two years due to covid we saw it fitting that we are able to celebrate with our fellow Arimians and anybody who's willing to come and partake in the festivities with us yeah you say that like you're not sure that people will come we know <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, ms ramchan Hi, good yeah. morning. Yeah. So w w what's, your, what's your take on it? I mean, how, how, what is your, the level of your involvement and, and what are you required to be executing? Well, 134 years is worth celebrating. Yeah. And seeing that we didn't have any celebration for two years due to COVID, right? We must take that opportunity to celebrate with our people. It's our way of saying we appreciate you and you are important. And 134 years, we have a, lot, a long list of activities for the month of August. So this week here, we're going to Friday with Parang on the Hill. And on uh, Saturday. Friday coming tomorrow? Yes, the 19th. Okay. Yes. Right. And that's at 7 p.m. Then on Saturday, we have the Health Fair, which would be at the Arima Health, no, sorry, at the Arima Community Center. And that is from 9 o'clock to about 3 o'clock in the evening. Yeah. A lot of testing. You get your vaccines, your sugar testing, pressure testing, physio, a lot of things you can get there. Uh, and at, it's all free. At that event, the, at the Arima Community Center? Community Center. That's the one on Church Street, which is just Anglican, Anglican Street? Anglican Street. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it is. And then on Sunday, we have the Gospel Night. Gospel is a part of our celebrations as well. So we have the Gospel Night on Sunday, the 21st, 6 p.m. at the Arima Amphitheater. Yeah. yeah. Lots of artists, yeah. lots and of the churches, is, is by the, 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 the bus station. Room and right. the bus right. Yes. Yeah. Um, so talk about the arrangements for all of this. Um, the arrangements. So, you know, it's very important for us that we involve our communities as best as possible. So everybody in Narima knows Home on the Hill. It is one of the iconic um, places to meet and to gather and to lie. And luckily, they fall in within my electoral district. So we are being hosted by them. So we'd just like to say thank you to Charlie and his team for, for allowing us to be there. And 
on Friday, which is tomorrow, for yeah. the Barang, we'll have four bands, two of which they are Los Sonidos, Joseph Bertrand, and mm -hmm. then we have Amante de, de Paranda. So we're looking forward to having these bands with us. Um, so tomorrow will be a spectacular night, and the thing about Arameans and, you know, persons within that area, our culture is very rich and special to us, so having a parang, which is already starting to play in Arima, by the way, we're looking forward to have that, those festivities coming on. And on, on Saturday, which is the health fair, we have that being, you know, we have the assistance of the U.S. Embassy, so U.S. Aid and UNICEF, so we would like also like to thank them for their yeah. assistance. So what, what kind of, what kind of um, assistance they are providing? Um, they staging events and they're taking part in, in, in distribution of, of services and that yeah, kind of so thing? So they're assisting all around with the, the health fair. So from the services, assisting us with um, whatever is required for the health fair to ensure that it is able to reach a wide group of persons. So we're looking forward to having the health fair pull off because we, we would have done one previously, which is led by Councillor Kendall Charles as well as Councillor Anthony Davis. Yeah. And it was spectacular in the past, so we're looking forward to that once again. And health fair, people getting tested for different kinds of, of... Correct. Because at the end of the day, in the midst of all the festivities, we also want to ensure that our Arameans are safe and we have you know, we're looking after them. So it's not just about the, the fun and the dancing and the parang, but it's also about ensuring that the health is also a priority to our purchases. Yeah, and I, mean, I know uh, Arima people are, you know, sort of a lot, in a lot of cases tied to, to their churches and, and so on, and okay. that, that is part of it, right? Yes, right? it is, yes, it is. Arima is rich as well with their denominational churches. We are lucky to have a lot of them. And we are blessed because a lot of people pray. They pray for this country. We are blessed. And by doing so, what I've done is integrate with a lot of the churches within the borough who are very willing to participate. We need to spread the gospel. We need to have that balance. And our mayor, he always insists we do pray at every meeting. So it is no surprise that we have gospel the inclusion of gospel as part of the activities for the Arima month of celebrations. So it's, it's a month of celebration. Yes, yeah, so. we started even before the, the first. Yeah, you know, we started with our church service, we would have had pan. Yes, we, we started with the naming of Queen Street Correct. to the Lord Kitchen Lord Avenue. Kitchen Avenue. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And that was just before the first of August. We, and then when we went to the first of August, we had the um, cannon blast. and. Activities after activities, plenty. Yeah. Um, my friend and, and longtime colleague Ashton Ford has been carrying on a campaign. In, in his, his articulation is that um, he and other people, Aremians, dedicated Aremians, do not feel that Arima gets the, 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 the sort of profile that it should and gets it, its, its just dues from, from authorities over, over a period of time. Uh, so many talented people have come out of Arima. So, so central arena has been to the development of, of Trinidad and Tobago and, and they, don't, they don't get a sense that uh, the, 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 the borough gets back the kind of, of recognition from those in authority for that. I'm not necessarily wanting to put you all on the spot, but is that something that um, the, 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 the organizers think about sometimes and, and to what extent they, they, you'll feel it? Um, the, the luster of the place is, is not what it should be. <laughs> Um, well, that's an interesting question, um, but we understand that there are some concerns that, you know, as Arameans, they would raise in terms of some of these services, you know, not being available. But, you know, luckily we have great relationships with many of the ministers who are working with us to ensure that we locate suitable accommodation. Yeah. so that we will be able to have these services back. So it certainly is not the case where, you know, we are forgotten or we are left behind, yeah. but 
making okay. sure that we have accommodation that is able to properly see about the burgesses in Arima and environs that is of great um, paramount importance to the council as well as many of the decision makers, be it the ministers and so forth. So you know we're even in the midst of locating um, a space so that we will be able to have an administrative complex. Yeah. So, so that, we, that is happening. Uh, that is weeks. correct. Yeah. Correct. So the thing about it is, we are working and we are making sure that Arameans are properly serviced. But we know that sometimes things take a bit of you know time, time yeah. to happen. Yeah. But it's it's not a a case where it is forgotten. So we listen and we understand the calls of people of you know those that we serve, and we are working towards ensuring that that those services are brought into well brought back to Arima yeah. and you can also continue to work with all stakeholders to do so. And, and one imagines their plans to, to sort of rebuild and re-establish the prominence of the Arima Town Hall and them kind of things. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. As you see it is already entering, it's yeah. up. We do, do have some challenges mm -hmm. but we'll get there. We will yeah. get there. It's up. It, it's in progress. You know there was a need for more funding and of course you have to apply for the funding and await the funding. But it is coming. Right. We are, uh, you know, unfortunately, we were pushing to have it for this for month for of this August. Year. Yes, and sadly enough, we didn't get it. But we are going to get it. Yeah, because I, I, I know that there, there are some of my friends and colleagues who are looking uh, and expect me to, to raise some of these matters. You know, they would say, "Well, you yeah. didn't ask, will you?" You know. <laughs> yeah. Let them rest assured that it is in progress, and council has done everything that we can possibly do to ensure we get the funding. Without funding, we cannot do anything, do you, you know? And there was some cost overrun and whatever, whatever. So we mitigate that factor and we are going to, it's going to get done. Yeah. So what about um, corporate and business support for, for this event, this, this, this uh, series of events to mark the 135th anniversary? Talk about oh. that. Yes, well, we, we um, <laughs> as I said, I remind it's a very blessed borough. Mm -hmm. So we certainly would have had the assistance from corporate Corporate Arima, sponsors, yeah. as well as persons outside of the borough of Arima who would have also, you know, recognized that, you know, Arima is a special place so that they want to assist with the celebrations. So that assistance has been, you know, greatly appreciated, not just by the Arima Borough Council, but as well as the Burgesses that we all represent. Yeah, so it, it was a tough going trying to, to get um, support of one kind or another. It, it is a bit challenging yeah. because some people say, well, you know, it's a little slow now and they are assisting other organizations as well. But they are still willing to give a little. Yeah. And a little goes a long way. And then some people would say coming out of the pandemic. The yes, to, yeah, that's to, the main to thing. To restart. And, and to restart. Uh, things slow, yeah. you know. But even though things slow, they still give you a little I promise, I come back, we'll give you a little something. Right. So, so it's just, just uh, re-established. So it, the thing is, is um, it starts to, the, the duration for it, for, for this, this celebration, it goes on for some days. Um, the end goes, of it ends until uh, at the, the end 21st, of... 21st, uh, yeah. where yeah. we have um, fireworks, hopefully. Yeah. So that will be where we bring down the curtains. Fireworks. Yes. That, that's on, on Independence Day. So it's on yeah. Independence yes. Day, correct. Yeah. All right, well, let's see what happens. So, so Home on the Hill, let's, let's go back to that again when, when that is. So that is this Friday yeah, yeah. at 7 p.m. Yeah. And for those who tomorrow don't... Tomorrow evening. Tomorrow yes. evening. Yes. And for those who don't know, yeah. it's Carib Circular in Calvary Hill. Yeah. You know, so it's... it's you could ask any Arimian which part of Home on the Hill is and they will be able to guide you if you don't know. So... We would like to extend an invitation, of course, to uh, everyone who's willing to come out. It will be a family event, and you know, I, I don't want to sound biased, but <laughs> para no, Canary Mar sounds sweeter. Well, well, of course, you know, you should, because it's, <laughs> you know, you lay claim to, to, to a lot of fame for that, for, okay, for right. Parang generally. generally. And, and Parang in Arima is, is a big thing a lot of people look up to. And you're kicking it off with that. So that is. I run down of what the activities are going to be for the marking of the 134th anniversary of Arima as a borough. Ms. Janice Scott, 
Councillor for Cavalry, and Ms. Leonard Ramchow, and Councillor for Malabar North. Thank you all very much for talking with us on Thank that. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for having us. Yeah. And you're forget. also invited as well, so I hope yes. that we can see you well, there. Certainly, certainly. We extend yeah. an invitation to <laughs> everyone. Come to Arima. Safe and um, nice fun, clean fun, and everything is free. Just come and have some Arima fun. Thank you very much. Thank All you right. very much, viewers. All right, we take a break. When we come back, we share with you some of the snippets from around the region before we ask you to watch this. Stay with us. Get ready for an explosion of music an August evening at La Jolla Auditorium featuring Leandra, Trikanal, David Baru and Marva, Nathaniel and from Tobago, John Arnold and Lynette Lewis. August 20th, $250. La Jolla Auditorium from 6 p.m. For more info, call 747-4289 or 262-2584. to tell authentic is as easy as one, two, three. Find it, match it, search it. Step one, find the style number on the tag. Step two, match the style number inside the jersey with the number on the tag. Step three, search it. A quick Google search of the style number will verify the jersey is authentic when the search results match the jersey being searched. Don't be fooled by counterfeit jerseys. Before you buy, remember to find it, match it, search it. Fan Zone, two locations nationwide. Center City Mall, Chaguanas, and Movie Town, Port of Spain. Nationwide delivery available. In this season, we talk more about health, wellness, and everything in between. I am so excited to share with you everything about health and wellness so that you can design the life that you've always dreamed of. Join me here on What's Up Doc. What's Up Doc, Tuesdays and Thursdays, here on WESN, Content Capital. Back to the program first from us in terms of our uh, look around the region we go to Barbados where Barbados today is reporting a development in which the, minister, the Prime Minister Mia Motley announcing a cap on gas and diesel prices at the pumps. For the second time in under six months consumers are set to get an ease from high prices at the pumps. At a news conference this evening Prime Minister Mia Motley announced that government has put a cap on gas and diesel prices for the next five months with effect from um, Friday morning um, we will have the price of gasoline at the pump capped at the price of $4.48 per litre and with respect to diesel at $4.03 per litre. That is therefore going to represent a reduction in pricing with respect to both items from where they currently are and the benefit of those prices will pass through, we believe, hopefully, to all consumers and all people relying on gasoline and diesel to be able to do their work.
Uh, we go to Guyana now, where one of the veteran politicians in that country has been sworn in as the new commissioner of the Guyana Elections Commission. They call it GCOM, and News Source Guyana has this report on that. Veteran politician and former general secretary of the governing People's Progressive Party, Clement Rohi, took the oath of office this morning as a new PP civic nominated commissioner on the Guyana Elections Commission. He takes up the seat left by Bibi Shadik, who passed away on Saturday. Mr. Rohi took the oath of office before President Irfan Ali at the office of the president. Hours before the Elections Commission was set to meet for its weekly statutory meeting. Speaking to journalists just after the swearing-in ceremony, the former government minister said he hopes that he will be able to contribute to the professionalization of the Ghana Elections Commission. He said part of that process will be to ensure the makeup of staff members at the commission mirrors the makeup of Guyana. So we need to have a staff that reflects what Guyana looks like. And this is going to be extremely important. Uh, it's also going to be important for the staff to be professional in the conduct of their activities and in their attitude towards people as well. So the front, the, the face of GCOM is not so much the commissioners, it's more the staff. Because on the ground is the staff that represents GCOM. It's the GCOM officials, so to speak, that uh, is the face, the public face, so to speak. Of, the, of how people perceive elections in Guyana. The People's Progressive Party has repeatedly raised concerns about the ethnic makeup of the permanent and temporary staff at the Guyana Elections Commission. Back in 2016, while he served as General Secretary of the PPP, Mr. Rohi claimed that staff members at GCOM were not hired on merit, since he was convinced that almost 95% of GCOM staffers are of one ethnic group. Questioned today about whether his statement that the Commission staffers needing to represent one what Ghana looks like is related to the ethnic makeup of the country and the staffers. Mr. Rohi said he is speaking about professionalism. I'm speaking about fundamentally the professional uh, face of GCOM. It doesn't really, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean the ethnic composition. You can have a multi-ethnic composition of GCOM, but the fact is that they all have to present a professional uh, face to the public not only in terms of image, but also in terms of what they do in terms of the concrete activities in the public domain. President Irfan Ali at a swearing-in ceremony congratulated Mr. Rohi on his new role and his contributions to public life over the years. The president said he believes Mr. Rohi's appointment will bring value to the Elections Commission. Mr. Rohi is no stranger to our country. He is no stranger to public life. And he is no stranger in his pursuit of free and fair elections, democracy, and building a country in which the rule of law defines our action and who we are as a people and as a country. I'm sure that with his experience, not only at the national level, but his previous experience at the Elections Commission will bring great value to the work of the Commission. It will help to strengthen the Commission. To Jamaica now, where a police officer has been charged with manslaughter following the death of his 18-month-old daughter. Jamaica News today reports on that. 40-year-old Detective Sergeant Sheldon Dobson has been charged with manslaughter in connection with the death of his 18-month-old daughter in January. Sergeant Dobson was charged today. He was taken before the St. Elizabeth Parish Court, where he was offered bail in the sum of $750,000 with surety. Sergeant Dobson is to return to court on October 25. The child died after she was left locked inside her father's vehicle for eight hours at the Black River Police Station on January 19. The policeman, who was expected to drop off his daughter at daycare, reportedly forgot that she was inside the vehicle when he went to work. And that's our broadcast for this Thursday morning. We thank you for watching. We tell you you can get in touch with us here at AM Prime. You could send your stuff to 
WESNCC on all our social media platforms. And you can send your emails to amprime at WESNCC.com. We want to thank you for watching. We want to thank our guests. I'm Andy Johnson for the rest of us. Thanks for watching. we we'll see you tomorrow. W-E-S-N.